And we're with Josh and Nick, and uh, welcome back to B-Shifter. Happy to have you here today. We are going to talk about improvement and feedback and making your department better. It's something that we all want to do, but so often we don't have good direction or we don't have a system to make things better. So when we look at continuous improvement, what do you guys think is the foundation that the improvement is built upon? What's the first step of that? So I think the first thing is, is there, it has to line up with some kind of expectation. So whether it's an SOP or an SOG or even a verbal expectation, if you, if you don't give people an expectation, then they really don't know what to do. So it's hard to say, how are you, how are you going to evaluate anything? So the expectation has to include kind of like the end goal piece of, uh, how are we going to do this? Maybe sometimes why we're going to do it. And then like, what, what do we expect this outcome at the end to be? Um, so really, if we're looking at running a fire department or you even look at, if you're just looking at an incident, you have to, in an incident case, you have to have some sort of a standardized SOG to say, this is what we do. And then you can kind of evaluate off of that. In development of the SOG, if, if we're putting together a policy, how do you think that should start? Because I've, I've been on departments with SOP committees. I've been on departments where the chief just writes it. I've had a, a combination of the two. What, what is, what is the beginning of that policy? What, what should that be built on? First of all, before we start, start to get into improvement. So I mean, one of the first things is I think you have to look at, look at like some best practice things. Like it starts there. Like what do we have to make sure we address for without any doubt that are best practice things that keeps, you know, our workforce safe and make sure that we deliver the best service that we can in the field. So, you know, I think it starts there. It doesn't need to be the, I cut and pasted something from some other fire department. You know, we really need to know like, well, why did this, this exist and where did it come from? And I mean, it, you could talk about all the way down to some, you know, uniform policy of you're going to wear your uniform, but you know, what we're here to really talk about today is like the fire ground. So how do we operate on the fire ground and what kind of drives us towards how we operate? What do we do? And, and, you know, and you have to connect the task tactical and strategic level pieces of that. So with blue card, you know, we have the blue card SOPs, which those blue card SOPs are not, that is the blue card SOP for blue card. Really. That's like a 200 and some page document about blue card. It's not your fire department's SOP on how you manage an event. You, you know, you can dissect some things out of that, but all of those, you know, pieces are there for you to build, uh, you know, an SOP or an SOG. And, you know, those are best practice things. I mean, they can be referenced back in an FPA and we see, you know, so many parts of it in um, NIOSH reports. And we see a lot of stuff that's come out of near miss reports. And we see, you know, uh, FSRI is now doing uh, some near miss reports. They just released uh, an incident, I think, from Georgia. And you see many of the things that we talk about with evaluation of critical fire ground factors and all of that in our system. Or, or in that report too, like, uh, so it has to come back to best practice. It can't just be a, I'm the fire chief. I got this thought. I'm going to write this SOP. This is what you're going to do. Cause I told you so. I mean, there, there has to be a reason behind it. It has to make sense. And, you know, to get to that, I think that I'm not a huge fan of the whole committee thing, but I think it has to be under review. Like you have to, you have to have the people who are going to use it and apply it, you know, as part of it, you know, to really get something out. I think that people are going to use and support and understand. And in, in a lot of our systems, we're working with multiple fire departments. We have mutual aid, aid groups. We have uh, auto aid groups. A lot of us are from smaller fire departments where we have five stations. So we're really dependent on our neighbors to come in. So how do you build that consensus with your neighbors then if you have policies that just apply to the fire ground? It's the way we are going to operate on the fire ground. How, how, do, how do we make that happen? Again, you have to start with that best practice and maybe start with a group of people, you know, a few people from each one of those agencies and, and, you know, knock down the barriers. And I don't give a shit if you're the chief captain, fireman, lieutenant, whatever you are, but you have to come up with like consensus of what is our end goal? What are we trying to do here? And, and John, you said it almost, I don't know, 99.9% of the U.S. fire service response was some sort of mutual aid. I mean, we're sitting in Phoenix and Phoenix uses auto aid. Every single day, big ass fire department still use auto. Houston fire department still uses auto aid every single day. I mean, it, 
there might be a handful that don't use some sort of auto aid. So uh, back to the point of you have to get those people in the room and figure out if we're going to go to fires together and work in the IDLH environment, we need to be on the same page. I can't have my SOP, SOG on how I operate on the fire ground and the neighbor have theirs and the neighbor next to them have theirs. Because when we all come together, we have to be operating under the same system. And, you know, so and it starts with that SOP, SOG thing. And what Blue Card does and what we see is Blue Card is, is really that glue that starts to bring departments together. And I'll just give an example. And we're not there yet, but I know that we're doing better today than we were yesterday. And I know we're doing way better today than we were a year ago. Uh, where I work in Hamilton County, Ohio, uh, 36 fire departments and the fire chiefs association finally agreed to change the SOGs from, you know, stuff that was hijacked in 1988, I think from, from the Phoenix fire department, Bruce Smith brought it back to Hamilton County from, you know, command symposium stuffs. And until a few years ago, the SOGs in the County said what Phoenix fire department was doing in 1988. And some of it's so relevant and good, but you know they they aren't doing the same thing today either. I mean, we, we don't do anything the same, you know, very long. The environment's changed, whatever's changed. So, in the last year, because of retirements, is a piece of it. You know, we were able to get some of the right players in the room and say, "Hey, we all run together, work together, and this shit ain't working." Uh, part of it through you know some after action stuff. One fire department starts shooting at an at another in an after action report. Well. There was nothing to base the after action on. It was just somebody's opinion because there wasn't a baseline of here's the expectation and this is what you do. Um, you know, so we got all of them to agree and on this, uh, like about 10 SOGs on how we operate on the fire ground. And, and it's all stuff that was pulled from, from Blue Card. And it's um, something that could work in a, you know, a county system. So, uh, we'll, we'll make those available to you, to people in the show notes or whatever. If, if people wanted to get access to them, it's a word document that they could, it's, it would save them some time that rather than going into the blue card SOPs and having to pull out and dissect all their own, you know, pieces of it. But uh, if you're going to respond together, then you have to have the same kind of operational things. What you do in the station is what you do in the station, but what you do out on the fire ground has to line up and everybody has to work within the system. So, you know, the SOGs was a huge part of it, and we've been doing blue card in the county since 2009, and it's helped to bring things a bit together, and it's a lot better, but everybody still didn't have the same SOG. So it was still hard to have an after action and talk about, hey, you didn't say this, or why didn't you do a 360, or we told you to bring a water supply, and you didn't. So what happened with that? You know, so laying out that front end ex expectations, SOPs, SOGs, and then having that line up with the training, which in our case is the blue card program for as far as how we, how we manage an event and organize an event and manage companies on the fire ground. So I think to get to the point where you have common SOPs and throughout jurisdictions, not just, you know, a couple of places, man, chiefs have to put their ego aside uh, I've been to so many meetings where we're talking about high rises and then somebody will just throw down the, well, we're going to have to agree to disagree on that. And I've been saying lately, we cannot say that anymore. We have to get some kind of consensus. It may not be 100% all the time, but I like that approach where, hey, we're going to have 10 things right now that we all do the same because that's a baby step, right? Uh, accountability. Uh, command, whatever, you know, May Days, whatever it is, we have to, those important things on the fire ground. If, if we can agree on that, then then we have a push start to, to get to the place where we can continue to improve, right? You know, the next step is, you know, really something that's missing everywhere is like, what does that after action look like? And I mean, everybody does some sort of after action and gets so opinionated and, you know, we like ladder shit and you like engine shit and you didn't, you said we didn't search and all that. Well, that has to have some sort of a standard approach too, that needs to have, you know, an expectation tied to it of how's this going to go, who's going to do it. What are we looking for? And really what we're looking for is a, we're trying to change behavior. We're, we're trying to reinforce behavior. So good behavior, we're trying to reinforce and then bad behavior. We're, we're trying to correct it. Hey, this, this wasn't so good, but this is what it sounds like when it's right. So how do we get to that point and what does that look like? And 
it all starts back at the beginning, the very first thing we talked about. If there's not an expectation, SOG, like what we're actually going to do, and then training tied to it, you can never get to the point of doing after action to get any continuous improvement, really. You're, you're just going to play in your own shit most of the time. So once we get to the point where we do have the expectation, SOP, policy, procedure, whatever, however, however we are memorializing what we're doing right and, and what right looks like, and then we go and put it into practice, then then how do we start to revise that and reinforce? The best example I know of that is uh, when we were in the recovery process in Phoenix. And after that event happened, we looked at it and said, okay, this was a failure of the rapid intervention system. It was, was a primary thing here. And that's what we took away. And we did for about the next year a bunch of drills on rapid intervention. And then we figured out, see, because we were fixing something then. It, it, it's, the improvement was saying this was this is broken and it doesn't work. It didn't work here and it, it's got to be fixed if we're going to rely on this in the future. So we did all this, this work and investigation and practice and the rest. And about a year and a half into it, we started to look at the, the cumulative effect after they started adding the numbers and looking, okay, this is what this looks like. And we figured out, no, this wasn't a failure of rapid intervention. It was just a failure of the system totally, and this is what happened. So we went to work trying to fix that. And every time we thought we were close, we started revising SOPs. And we would <clears throat> see a lot of the stuff we did, we did back then, and probably even do today, especially on the structural firefighting side, was things... The SOPs were things that we thought would work based on this worked and this worked. So if I change this a little bit and apply it over here, this should work. And then you would test it on the task level in a sterile setting. And so what that did is we created over the years a system that we refined that we thought, okay, this is what is this is what this looks like, the firefighter safety system. And then, like I said, it blew up. And then we went to fix it, and then we figured out, no, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And once we got on the right track, we started writing SOPs, but then you would find some element that needed to be adjusted that kept throwing it off. So it was the safety officers at that time and said, no, they got to be embedded into the regular operation. So we put a moratorium on uh, revising any procedures. We said, we're going to drill and work this until we get it right. And, to, and then we're going to do it until we don't get it wrong anymore, as we're going to fix this all the way. And that took about three and a half years to figure out exactly. This is how this looks. This is how this looks. And there were strategic things we were screwing up. There was some task level stuff. Those were minor. It was the tactical level piece that was missing. That, it was absent in the thing. Because we thought, well, this is the way this looks. Well, no, it isn't. This is the way it should look. And then when you look at like bigger urbanized fire departments, especially that have like high rise buildings where they have fires in them, that's the way they operate is they start putting chiefs up on the fire floor where the problem is. And that's <clears throat> and you think, oh, this is why they do it like this. So they have much more capability. We have a much more robust tactical level now. So those were operational changes. Those weren't personnel changes. So once we figured that out and put all that in writing and then we exercised it. Now, the reason this went so well is because the workforce was all involved and making the changes because this, it was the first time a command training center was the first time we had the strategic tactical and task levels training together. And then that worked so well, we took that out and said, no, nah, <clears throat> this ain't firefighter training, laying hose. This is fire department training and the BC has got a role in that. And so do the shift commanders. And we're going to do this like it's a real event. <clears throat> so that's the way we did our quarterly training as we set them up to be realistic drills. Well, so that kind of merged all three of those levels together and forced them to work together to figure that out. That helped to get out of that committee thing that where we were doing it in a sterile classroom with people representing administration and the labor. So that's a political process to, to fix an operational system. That don't work. So, and everybody figured that out. They said, no, 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 you got to put the people responsible and the people that do it every day in the same room and they're going to figure the shit out. So that's kind of what happened. And we got to that point, 
And it, it, this is a pickup of the last podcast we did, is we had three deputies at the time. And we said, no, we got this figured out enough. We need to start changing the SOPs because we have a volume now that started in the mid-70s. And we've kept about 90% of it and haven't thrown it away. And it don't hook up to 2008. So it, there's too many gaps so somebody needs to sit down and redo all of this. We went to the our bosses and said, we need a fourth position. We need a, a staff deputy that's going to work at the CTC that is the presence there. And the plan, there was three of us doing this. It's Garrison, Hinton, and me. So we got a fourth deputy, and we came up. We said, you owe three months. We quarterly switch. And one guy, if we're going to... We'll figure out what we need to do. One will start it, and then the next one comes in. So you didn't go to staff. Is You worked in a workforce where you cycled into the CTC to manage that. And then that was going to give the shift commanders back, and they wouldn't go out of service. So we had the guy there to teach all the time, do the administrative work to get the SOPs up to date. Well, about, I don't know, probably... Three to six months after that system went in place, the fire chief retired and a bunch of changes were made. That kind of that that became less of a big deal. They said, no, you guys fixed that a long time ago. We're, we're doing other things now. We're really good on command right now. So we're going to just stop that for a bit. Which was a mistake. It is yeah. So twelve years later, they, they, they not much has happened. They they stopped the system to keep everything current and up to date, and they changed that in other places. So everybody retired. We all ended up here in this building together, and we're doing the same stuff again. So, but that whole system came out of a mutual aid system, where you had to get permission. If you needed resources from the next fire department, from Glendale or Tempe, you, I need a second alarm. Well, that was going to be three Tempe units, and they had to get permission from the Tempe Fire Department to send those units. So it's the, I don't know, mid to late 70s, the three fire chiefs of those the main departments in Maricopa County, handshake deal, said, no, nah, we ain't doing that anymore. It's one response organization, and we're all going to use the same SOPs. So we all operated off the same volume. And so 30-some-odd fire departments all were dancing. on Maricopa County was basically one operational fire department. Still is today. It's a very robust, strong system. So that's where it all started. And <clears throat> so to Josh's point earlier that, no, we don't have four different ops manuals. We have one, and this is kind of what we hold you responsible for. Now, one of the problems with that that pops up in that system especially an older system where the SOPs aren't necessarily aligned. Because rapid intervention was a brand new thing. SCBAs were a new thing. No max hoods. I mean, you can go back in time in the SOPs and look, oh, we added this here, here, and here. There's conflicts now within them. So especially with like rapid intervention, there were places in our SOPs where if you got sued, you settled. If you didn't put it on a promotional exam because it was going to have to get rekeyed or tossed. So you thought, no, we just stay away from those. Well, nobody could ever fix those snags because nobody ever would sit down long enough. And we didn't think they were a big enough issue that deserved it anyway. We thought, oh, we just manage around that. It's not a big deal. But all of those little things are like mouse traps laying there. And when our we got our Waterloo that day in 2001, a lot of that shit popped up and thought that, that, and that, and this all comes together. And it just, <clears throat> it made an impossible situation worse. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the. So you, you've got to identify those things ahead of time if you can, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. without the Waterloo. So how do you identify the policies, procedures, practices, updated best practices before it becomes a problem? So I think one thing is that, I mean, we have to learn from we have to learn from all the events that we go to and all the events that everybody else goes to. So I think we need to identify when things go right. What does that look and like? What are they doing? And can we emulate that? But when things go wrong, why did that happen? And have we addressed that? So, you know, Nick said it like in, in 2001, they thought the whole Southwest supermarkets fire was a writ problem. And it, it, it turned out it, that that was a little piece of it, but it wasn't a writ problem. There was a list of other things. And so since we're on this and a lot of people are going to hear this, 
If you're using Phoenix Fire Department SOGs from 1999 or 2001, which everybody in the United States hijacked them, you need to update your shit. Like it's 2023 and shit is different today than it was, you know, yesterday. And you're not using the same paramedic protocol you were using in, you know, 1999. So, Mm -hmm. you know, start using the updated stuff. So, you know, we go so many places and we hear so many people, well, we got this from Phoenix. Well, that was right in 1999. That's what they thought worked. But in 2001, two, three, four, five, there was, they said this shit didn't work and they pushed it out. And, you know, Command safety came out and it addressed some of those things from the Brett Tarver incident. But, you know, we hear so many people are still doing that. So you have to look at all of these events and see if your organization, <laughs> your response system is, is addressing these things. It's it's kind of like uh, the NTSB or whoever the hell it is that sends out recalls on cars. I mean, it, the airbag's bad and, you know, 500,000 cars. Well, it goes to 500,000 people that own those cars. And then the fire department, it seems like, why well, hijack these SOPs? I haven't updated them since 1999, and we haven't had a problem yet, so they must work. And, and I'll get focused on the RIT thing a little bit because it's like the, that keeps coming up. We do RIT, we do and It's like, well, Blue Card does RIT on steroids. Like we, I said, the entire response system and everything that goes on with it, which is the thing that came out of the Southwest supermarkets of no one company is going to save you know anybody. And really, if you can't save yourself, it, it, it may not turn out very good anyway. But – you know, the very first thing with Blue Card on deck is first and foremost RIT. And if you've got two attack positions, then you might have, you could have four on deck companies that are your, you know, your RIT team. So, you know, people get all wrapped around the Blue Card doesn't do RIT and we do RIT and we had designed RIT and you know, whatever. And it's like, well, you don't even know what the hell you're really doing. The only thing you're doing is whatever some SOP says mm-hmm. that you stole from 1999 and you just haven't updated it and you're so wrapped around it that. Because you don't even know what you don't know. I mean, it's like, well, this is what we have, and this is what we do, and we haven't had a problem before, so this has got to be what it is. And it's like, there's more to it than that. So just because you haven't had the experience, you need to look at everybody else, what's going on with everybody else. It's the, I mean, if somebody has a Scott Airpack problem, everybody's going to get notification that, oh, the, or MS, who, I don't care, who, whoever it is, any event, ABC vendor of Airpacks. Everybody's going to get notified. Oh, there's a there's a there's an issue with whatever it happens to be, and we're all going to do something about it. Well, so many of these other things that we don't want to do any work on, SOPs, an example. Eh, we'll just we'll get around it. We haven't had a problem with it before. We don't do anything with it, but it starts there. That's where the expectation thing has to come from of what works, and when when it does work, then that's what we're going to train on and make sure that it works. But it has to be verified that it works. It just can't be. Yeah, we have an SOP, and we did that one time in the in the lab, and we ran a mayday on two channels and for five minutes, and it worked. And it's like, well, it didn't work for shit. Like you didn't do nothing with that. That was that was smoke and mirrors. That really wasn't a test. You know, the test was five years of mm-hmm. putting thousands of people through all kinds of exercises at the task tactical strategic level after Brett Tarver died. So one of the things I find interesting is the amount of uh, misinformation that's out there. And you go into a place and, you know, they're, they're doing blue card. And they're thinking, well, we can't do blue card because of this. And, and they throw it like safety. Is, is it, you don't use safety officers correctly in blue card. You don't do rapid intervention correctly in blue card. And they say, oh, okay, where, where does it say that? Well, in the, in the, in the different standards. <clears throat> Which standards? Well, you know, the, the standards the NFPA writes. Oh, okay. So it's the NFPA standards that we're violating. Yes. <clears throat> Have you read them? <clears throat> oh, yeah. And this is what they say. And you're like, you haven't read them. You don't know what's in them. You don't know the difference between an incident safety officer, a health and safety officer. A de- the safety officer is supposed to be in the IC's hip pocket, if you read NFPA 1521, and they have a bunch of assistant safety officers out on the scene doing stuff. So they have to be close to the IC so they can vet the plan and all the other stuff. Well, we use a safety section to do that because section positions is what NIMS uses in the command post. So we have a safety section in blue card, and that's the safety officer piece, and they manage the safety officers. So if you go to a big incident, and let's say it's a sprinkler-controlled fire, it's going to be a long-term offensive thing, and you end up with three divisions with BCs running them, with their safety officer aides. Well, they can go to a safety channel now and do the accountability piece on a safety channel. 
in the command van without disturbing anything on the tactical channel. So you have a redundant system now to your tactical level bosses and your safety officers and two different people connected sitting next to each other in command posts. Does your system do that, Mr. Safety Officer? Well, no, what we do is we put a green helmet on, we run around in circles. And he said, oh, okay. That, that. And how, what's the NFPA say about that? Well, that's what we should be doing. And that's, now you need to read the standard. Have you read anything about rapid intervention anywhere? <clears throat> because this is kind of ground zero of all where that happens. So it's, it's almost, it feels like Noah's showing up and there's people that live in the desert that are telling him about the flood. And you're like, you don't have the slightest idea of what you're talking about. It's nuts. <laughs> I've been to trainers in the last six months, and it's getting, it's gotten a lot better, but it's, in some cases, it's gotten worse. As some of the arguments you're hearing now is shit I heard in the 90s from people up talking about NIMS, and no, NIMS, we have to do the attack group, and and this and that, and you're like, N no, they, you, you can't, uh, it doesn't work. It, it's, oh, yeah, have you ever done it in real life? Oh, we do it every day. Where? 1,500 square foot houses. But it, we can port that same system to high-rise building. It'll work just as well. And you think, nah, this is not. You do not have a total quality uh, improvement system here. Is it, it, a lot of it is they're trying to, to reinforce old, outdated practices. I don't know why, but it's just, it, uh, maybe it gives them comfort for some reason. Uh, they're more attached to the back. Well, Vance, you said the other day there's a group that want to go back to uh, three-quarter pull-up three boots. Pull boots. Yeah. So they can make grabs. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's <laughs> These are almost masturbation <laughs> fantasies they're having. It really is. I, I mean, you... I, I saw a thing a week ago that said... If your union number, if your local number has more than three digits, you're not a real fire department. I mean, there's all that crap out there, which I don't know where any of that comes from. But, it, it, you know, people get in their echo chambers and we hear it over and over again. And it's a, it's ridiculous. So looking at the policy, we, we get the we get the right policy. Right. Um, we refine it. Uh, we pr we start to practice it, but there has to be a mechanism of feedback in order to continue to improve it. So once once we get it right, which I think we could sit all day about talking about the policy itself, trying to get it right. But once we get once we get something in place, we want to make sure we get it right. How do we start to get the feedback and exercise that? You, you exercise it in like the field and practice and full scale exercises, you know, and, and a little bit of a controlled environment to see what that looks like. And oftentimes that's not going to look, it's probably not going to look exactly like it does in, in a dynamic, you know, IDLH like type house fire, building fire event, but it's a, it's an opportunity to at least exercise it. And, and sometimes you can say, oh, this shit ain't going to work for us. Or, or <sighs> there's so many fire departments that wear a costume and they try to take somebody else's SOP and try to make it theirs. And it's like, well, that fire department has five person people on an engine and you got two. And that fire department trains their company officers and you don't. So like all of those things are a problem. So the, the thing is, is like you got to you got to get something that's applicable for you, something that's best practice that makes sense. That's that policy procedure guideline piece. You, you train everybody on it. What does that really mean? And then when you're exercising it, you know, out in the field, the full scale thing. So Monday, you know, the football teams, you know, and in, in, on Tuesday, they're just wearing helmets and pads. On Wednesday, they do whatever. Thursday, full scale. Friday, we're going to review tape for whoever we're playing Saturday or whatever that looks like. Well, you know, that's where we're at with the fire department. Like it's this is what we're going to do. This is the play. We're going to run it. We're going to continue to progress with this. And then the, the, they play the game Saturday. And immediately there starts to be feedback. Well, we go to the fire and the incident commanders start to provide some immediate feedback of what's going on. And so does everybody else that's a company officer that gets to make decisions through, you know, priority traffic reporting or status changes or, you know, whatever's going on. And we continue to evaluate those critical factors. No different than on the we're in a life safety position, but no different than on the sports field like <clears throat> this shit we're doing on offense ain't working with that defense. We're going to have to do something else. So we, we adjust that. And, and then. <clears throat> the biggest thing is after that's all over, after the fire's over, looking back on it, what worked, what didn't work, getting feedback from all the people. So we talk about it, you know, uh, and, and really the wrap up of, of an incident, that whole tailboard critique thing. 
and getting immediate feedback, what worked, what didn't work, why did you do what you did, you know, at least on those front end companies. And then the after part of it of, you know, <clears throat> reinforcing, hey, Engine 7, that was really good. You guys did good. What happened in there? And sometimes you'll get some feedback of like, I didn't realize that that happened or that it looked like that or, you know, whatever. And then, you know, the whole scaled thing of, uh, of getting some kind of a, a survey piece out to them of like, what did you see? What did you do? So their input. <clears throat> but the second part of that is, is measuring like kind of the, the, the fixed standard expectation thing. So what did this event look like lined up back to this first step of these SOPs, X, SOGs, expectations? So in the blue card system example, just like when you're in the classroom doing a cert lab, initial radio report, follow-up report, sign a few companies, command transfer, strategic shift maybe, assigning divisions, can reports throughout the event, managing communications process. Well, in an inc- when we review an incident, that's another piece of it. So we do the survey part where we get the actual people's feedback that were there, what did they see, what did they do, what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to do. But then we evaluate based off that, we can evaluate based off that radio traffic, just like we do in the classroom. How did this go and how did it sound? And, you know, we say it all the time, far too often when that front end's screwed up, the back end's going to be screwed up, right? And it's really hard to, it's really hard to fix that. So you can identify things that we're doing good and reinforce that behavior, but you can identify some things that you can improve on you know, and evaluate. And in some case, it might might mean you need to adjust your SOP, SOG, if it's if that's what it is. The Phoenix thing, right? The It wasn't a training piece on RIT. It was this whole big process thing of we thought that was going to say the Phoenix Fire Department thought that was going to be the thing. And so did every other fire department across this country, and, and some still think that. See, they do. They think that because you're a writ that you somehow are going to be able to go in and save somebody. And that's not what it is. You're just a, you're a firefighting crew. There's nothing special about calling them a writ. It's the, but three minutes before they were engine three, they got to the scene and you made them a writ. It, it's, uh, so the first company got in trouble. Well, the writ will go get them. Well, if the first company got in trouble because the building grabbed them and the fire, the writ's going to have the same goddamn octopus attacking it. That's where you get, if you don't solve it in five minutes, the writ has a mayday. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's this whole, th- oh, we have a writ, we're good. You, you No, I have a lock on my door too, buddy. That's <laughs> that's going to stand up until somebody kicks it hard. Uh-uh. <clears throat> Sorry. <but> they, they, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so how, what's a mechanism for that feedback? How, how do we get that feedback? So you talked about the tailboard critique. And we, we identify something. Hey, man, that didn't work. Whatever it was. Maybe it's a new hose load. Maybe it's a mm-hmm. widget that you bought for your department. Maybe it's a procedure we have. How, how do you get that feedback so it's meaningful? So one thing is it, the whole operant conditioning thing, right? And I've said it a few times in here. But, like, we've got to reinforce good behavior. And we got to make sure that, like, what we don't want to happen, that we make it clear that this isn't going to happen again. So that's a way. I mean – However you do that, you got to make it meaningful. And then you got to make it, you got to make it real and make it make sense. And you got to have the light bulb come on. So that's a whole piece of it. And, and I think there's a lot of processes for that, but we have a lot of organizations that we're connected to that are doing every single Friday. They do, uh, they do blue card Friday every Friday and they come in and they talk about what went good last week or what went good two weeks ago, or, Hey man, we identified a lot of it's not even blue card. A lot of it's other things that they're identifying, like. Jesus Christ, we didn't know that these two new engines had different connect. Well, whatever, but they're actually having a place to get in a room and talk about fire department operations and, and hearing from the people, as Nick said earlier, that are in the field. It, it's not this isn't an administration and a union thing or the fire chief pushing down something. This is all the people involved, and if you got something that's going to be for the better, then say it. But you have to have you have to have those conversations about the event. It can't be well. Nobody got hurt in the building then burned down. So I guess we're good. High five. When's where's the next? And it's like, no, we should be looking to do better because I, I, we always have an opportunity to do better, right? Command function seven. We should always be looking at what's going on. Well, in our system, we should always be looking at the system of what, what can we do to make 
that better. So I think there's all kinds of different platforms to do that, depending on what your organization looks like and how big you are and all that. And how, how often then could you connect the people if you did something every Friday or if it becomes quarterly or whatever. And uh, that's just a piece of it. We used RBO committees, right? So we had a, a, an a operations committee and they would cycle uh, whatever was going on, any issues, anything like buying apparatus, SOPs, the whole thing. And so they met quarterly. And that was, and they would make subcommittees and they would study things. They would report back to the main committee. And that was, it was a committee. And that's the way it worked. The real deal happens when you train them. So we open a CTC, you got the strategic, tactical, and task levels all in the room together training. And you and you come to agreements is what it is. This is why we do it like this. Boom, boom, boom. So we get done with whatever lesson it is and said, okay. So as an example, we went from RIT to on deck <clears throat> that fast. Did it on a Tuesday, engine 26, asked a couple questions, engine 30, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we did that at 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock that night, working house fire. Engine 26, you take on deck. Copy 26 going on deck, front yard. We'll put the Rick bag up from your Rick. Boom like butter, worked perfectly. We did it after action review right then, took three minutes. That was solid. Oh, it was great. Blah, blah, blah. We did this. And blah, blah. Everybody hugged, kissed, confirmed that that's the way to go. Next time we come back to train CTC, hey, last shift we had a fire. This is what happened. This is how this worked. See, and we're changing shit. So now you're t- taking notes and saying, okay, this is good. We're going to keep this. We're going to move this over here. Boom, boom, boom. So it's almost like you perfected your recipe. Everybody comes in, we get done with the training cycle. It says, that's it. <laughs> no more RIT. It's on deck. That's the way this works. Well, that was a deal where the, the, the response partner said, ooh, no, we won't do that. This is, some of them had huge issues. Came in, told them, this is the way we're doing this. Boom, boom, boom. Explained. Oh, we understand it. We just like the old way better. Next training session, the fire chief came in. <clears throat> he says, been some questions about what we're doing. This is what we're doing. This is where it gets changed in this building. If you don't like what's going on, then you need to come here and represent your side of it. And he says, the group will figure out the best thing. We've finally got a system where we can do that now. So we did it through training. And then what that did is that gave the bosses the, the system to manage improvement with the workforce. So you agreed on Tuesday, this is what we're going to do. Next week, something happens, and that's not what whoever did. So now in the after action, and you may not do it right there. You're going to take them off the side and say, hey, what the hell happened here? And they're going to explain to you what happened. And about 80% of the time, that becomes a personnel issue There's, because they didn't do it for whatever reason. Now, you're going to get them back into to, uh line by training and saying, no, this is the way we do this. So depending on their reaction to that, that's going to kind of dictate what's happens to them next. But typically the most effective way is just, yeah, I was wrong. I screwed up next time. I'm, I'll, I, I've been doing it the old way for too long. I'm, I'm still learning. Well, we're patient. We know what that looks like. So yeah, me too. <clears throat> I say the wrong thing sometimes. Mm-hmm. So anyway, you don't want it to be fatal for anybody. And in fact, if the system works, uh, what I witnessed is you had uh, separation between like BCs and the companies that they supervised. They didn't like them. For, they, they, they got crossways for whatever reason. When we started training together and then you use this system after about two to three years as those problems started going away. As you had, everybody got along better because we trained together, agreed on things, and then we held each other, as Garrison says, accountable for that. And that's the job of the bosses is to say, no, this is what we agreed on. And this is the way I'm going to enforce the law. And this is, and I'll do whatever is the gentlest to get you back into the fold with the rest of us. So it, most of the time, that's a simple, it's as easy as having a two minute conversation after fire. Don't do that again. That, that was screwed up and we're going to change it this way next time. And, you know, we've talked about this. So it, it gives you a better <clears throat> system to capture what's right and then to instill that throughout the rest of the organization. And it gives people who have a better way of doing something a, a, a system that they can input that and, and process that through. So it becomes a better way to do your business, I guess. We're working on an after-action solution for uh, 
organizations to use to help them, you know, through the process of after action? Because there's, you know, not any one great way out there. So <clears throat> Blue Card has SOPs. Blue Card's got a training platform. You have to, you know, train people and deploy the system. And then on the back end of it, we're we're gonna we're gonna work and uh, help organizations figure out. Well, how do I really review our success and, and fix you know whatever we need to fix? So to, people can just stand by, stand by for that. So we're working on a we're working on a solution that we can share with everyone for that to help with organizational behavior to to help to help organizations evolve into the policy and procedures. And this will be some kind of platform for them to get on and and plug all those things in. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So like a a formalized way for organizations to do after action reviews at, at actual incidents. And I mean, you could use it. You can use it to evaluate, you know, full scale training exercises. So all for the purpose of you know continuous improvement within your organization. Timeless tactical truth. It's been a while. And this is the nine of clubs. Use staging. Assignment by the IC and accountability SOPs to get firefighters into the standard work cycle. I've witnessed this a lot in my career, especially because I've been in a few different states, that staging isn't always used to get into a standard work cycle by the IC. Uh, What happens when we don't use staging? You end up with every company that responded that has their own incident action plan. Yes, Vince. Assignment by the IC is uh, the pathway to uh, a single IAP that actually matches the incident conditions. Because you do a size up, once that person sizes it up, then they assign everybody based on that size up. So, and then, see, really, if you... What you said is uh, staging, assignment by the IC, and accountability. That is the way the IC controls position and function for everybody on the fire ground. So not only do you use a single incident action plan, the other thing you do is you provide strategic level safety for everybody operate in the IDLH. So the, the IC is responsible for keeping the strategy correct which has the greatest effect on firefighter safety and survival for everybody operating in an incident, uh, an IDLH hazard zone, period. If you don't do that, <clears throat> that you ain't following the safety system, folks. Again, more misinformation out there. Razzmatazz. Carol. <laughs> All right, that's good.